Would you like to have access to any photo ever taken of you, anytime, anywhere? Stay tuned for episode 51 of Veteran on the Move as I talk with Army veteran Sonny Tosco, CEO and founder of Limelight Mobile. What's up, everyone? This is Scott Fuzzle from Command Your Business. You're listening to Veteran on the Move with Joe Crane. Welcome to Veteran on the Move. If you're a veteran in transition, an entrepreneur wannabe, or someone still stuck in that J-O-B trying to escape, this podcast is dedicated to your success. And now, your host, Joe Crane. Sonny Tasco is a 2006 graduate of the United States Military Academy with a degree in psychology and systems engineering. Upon graduating, he was commissioned as second lieutenant in air defense artillery. Sonny served active duty for six years and is a three times Operation Enduring Freedom veteran, having deployed to Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and UAE. In 2012, Sonny left the service as a captain to pursue a career in the civilian sector. After being frustrated with his last job and the early passing of a close Army brother, he decided to start his fifth venture, Limelight Mobile. Hey, Sonny, welcome to the show. Appreciate you having, having you on Veteran on the Move. And before we get started talking about business and entrepreneurship, if you could share with us what you did when you were in the Army. Yeah, absolutely, Joe. So I'll uh, go ahead and start from the beginning. So uh, I grew up in East San Jose to an immigrant family, and my father lived through the Japanese invasion of the Philippines in World War II. And after liberating the Philippines, the nation had a special kind of love for General MacArthur. And since he was a West Point graduate, my dad planted the seed in my head at a young age that that's where I was going to go to school. So I started to look into it more seriously as I grew older and made it my goal to be a graduate of the esteemed institution. Uh, September 11th happened my senior year, and that's when I felt compelled to do my part for the country I was blessed to be born in. Um, I was held up medically, though, for being born with an enlarged heart and having exercise-induced asthma as a kid. But I really didn't let that deter me. I ultimately was accepted June 6, 2002, three weeks before our report date. And uh, unfortunately, my father found out he had cancer around the same time. So I was torn between staying back to help take care of the family and leaving to pursue this opportunity. But, you know, him and I talked and he told me that I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity because I'm going to go out there and do great things in the world one day. So that said, it became an easy decision from there. So while at the academy, my commitment was really tested. Mondays to Saturdays, we slept an average of four and a half hours of sleep per night. And that's because the course load there is strenuous. And on top of that, you have your mandatory physical and military requirements to meet. While I was there, I majored in psychology and systems engineering because I always had an appreciation for the humanities and their effects on an organization. And uh, somehow I graduated, and on May 27th, 2006, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant in their defense artillery. So I was stationed out at Fort Bliss, El Paso, Texas, bought a house, lived there for six years. And during that time, I started out as a fire control platoon leader on the Patriot Missile System. So it's a very technical branch, and we all had to learn fast on the job. But uh, one of my favorite quotes is from Emmett Smith, which goes, all men are created equal. Some just work harder in preseason. A little Eric <laughs> Thomas there, you know? <laughs> yeah, I love that one. So one thing I will say I'm great at is going above and beyond to make things happen. So eventually I took charge of our launcher platoon. And even though it's not a lieutenant level job, I made it a pro- point to certify on our launcher drill with my driver so I could empathize with their struggles on the job and have the foundational knowledge to be a better Patriot operator. So we eventually became the best crew in the battalion, being the only crew to receive a first-time go on our evaluation. Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, 2008, I had my first deployment to Bahrain, and I was doing double work as the battery executive officer and crew one on the missile system. So I'd do eight hours in the van, then go to the talk and do eight hours as the executive officer. I'd sneak in a few sets of sandbag curls in the day, and that's how we carried on for almost 18 three months uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh since we were the first patriot unit ever in that country it was a great opportunity to test my leadership abilities in ambiguous circumstances so uh we redeployed in june 2008 and i was moved up to being a tactical director 
moved up uh, one echelon in the kill chain, and now I had the responsibility of calling shots to subordinate Patriot units, serving as the liaison between our assets and the Air Force. And uh, during that time, I was one out of two lieutenants selected to attend the ADAFCO course. So I passed the course, and when I moved up, I took my whole crew with me, Nicholas Shaver and Brandon Bird, because we were so effective as a team. We were like a cooler version of LeBron, Wade, and Bosch, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love that. Yup. So uh, we de deployed again in 2009 for 10 months to UAE, where we established the first Patriot command and control node in that country, as well as a few more missile sites. So came back November 2009 and was sent to Saudi Arabia in January uh, 2010 to provide military assistance to their Patriot program. So shortly after that, my crew was sent to Yuma, Arizona to participate in the WTI exercise where we were. The oh, first yeah. I've been there many times. Yup. <laughs> I'm a two time veteran myself, Joe. All right. Did you get the patch? Uh, no, didn't get the patch, but we were the first unit in Patriot history to walk out with a victory. So, oh, nice. Uh, that, that was one of those things I'm proud to look back on. So, um, unfortunately, I was stuck in the same unit, though, for the past three years, and I had a year left on my contract. So I wanted to go to another unit to get additional skills besides just being an air defense rap god. So I went to Colonel Warnicky's office and got on his calendar for a meeting. Their unit was deploying in a few months, which would extend my contract out. But opportunities are like pictures. You got to take them when they're there, you know? Yeah. So I made the decision to extend my time for one more deployment. And that was one of the best decisions I've made. And it was kind of like what Steve Young felt like when he left Tampa Bay, you know? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. So, uh, so I was moved up to being the operations officer, basically a chief of operations for our Bahrain element for a split battalion deployment. So I was being an S3, usually a job reserved for a major, but I'm forever indebted to Major Hall for seeing in me something I didn't see in myself. So to this day, the team we built, led by Major C and Sergeant Major Boone, and the energy we had will always hold a special place over there in my heart. And it was definitely a case of the haves and the have-nots um, with us living in squalor, but our under-resourced, undermanned team had the best engagement ops and readiness among the other Patriot battalions in the region. And we were the only unit that dealt firsthand with the Arab Spring. Uh, the culture we built with the team we had over there definitely allowed us to accomplish the impossible by everyone playing selflessly for each other. But uh, ultimately, I made the decision to get out in 2012. Um, after deployment, everyone scatters and it was time for me to move on as well. So May 26th, 2012, my last day in uniform, I uh, attended my cousin's graduation at West Point, swore him in and called it a career. Wow, what a great story. And I, I, really, I really love hearing immigrant stories like yourself, uh, like, like you yourself had. Um, just, you know, immigration is big in the news these days and everything, but um, you know, immigration is what, made, what, is, what has always made this country great. And I love hearing the, the true American uh, success story. Absolutely. So, what was, uh, so you're getting out of the Army. What was the transition out of the Army like? You know, what, was it good for you, bad for you? Did you have any plans as to what you wanted to do? Were you floundering? Right. So uh, in hindsight, I actually had a rough transition. Um, my ultimate goal was to come back to California. You know, when I was a young, hungry kid eating ketchup soup, I always told myself that wherever the army took me, all roads would lead to home. So I went with a headhunter, came across a job bringing me back to the Bay Area, Bay Area with a uh, yerba company. So they sold it as an entrepreneur opportunity, which is what appealed to me the most. So I took a yearbook for two years in high school and loved photography, so it seemed like a win-win. Took my territory mid-year. After the previous rep in the area, failed to do anything for his schools. So I went in there, and the first thing that the territory needed was culture change. So I came in there with a plan to start holding people accountable for their actions. You know, not asking for much here, but uh, truth is it's a soft generation of students I was working with that placed a higher emphasis on the appeasement of feelings than results. <laughs> and uh <laughs> it's sounds <all> familiar <laughs> so uh there was a time actually um when i went to a high school to talk to a class and uh at this particular school you know each senior has four months to complete a senior page it's like a whole page that they could customize to their liking so they're given four months to complete this which is more than enough time so that day um this is around february time frame 
um, a senior came in upset that the yearbook staff placed a picture of the school tree on his page. And uh, visually, they're not just going to leave the page blank, so they'll find something to fill the page if the student doesn't turn anything in. So this student was yelling at the teacher because his senior year was ruined because of this. But what I was most surprised to see was that the teacher was just looking at the ground and taking this verbal lashing. So, uh, I mean, call me soft, but growing up, the teacher ran the class, you know? So yeah. I, I couldn't watch this invertebrate take it anymore. So the old captain came out. <laughs> <Uh-oh>. <laughs> so I cut the kid off and I said, hey, wait, so it's unfair to hold you accountable for something you were given four months to complete. And now it's our fault. So this kid looks at me and takes his printout and shoves it in my chest saying, here, you look at it then. And I never pictured being subjected to this type of disrespect from a 17 year old after I got out. And, you know, first instinct was to put his head through the ceiling for that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I balled up my fists, started sweating profusely, and the room was just silent. As I mo- paced across the room and I was just talking to myself, I was telling myself, hey, don't, don't hit don't, him, don't hit him, don't hit him. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's like, hey, this isn't the army. You do that. You're just going to be labeled another crazy vet with PTSD. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing this and he just got uncomfortable and left, which was probably best for him, you know? Yeah. I'm not an angry person, Joe, but I also wouldn't mind reacquainting him with the tooth fairy. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. So uh, I, I stuck with the job, though, you know, and I kind of had to. Um, but what I didn't realize is how much of an emotional toll it was taking on me as an individual. You know, I was becoming a worse iteration of myself because I had to make numbers. And uh, that summer, they came back with less than half of what I was promised. They pulled a classic bait and switch and took advantage of a good person. And at the time, I just had my son. And when you're in that position, you tend to err on the conservative side. So, you know, I told myself, I'm going to sign a new business this year. And the existing schools I have will have me for a full year. So we won't make the same mistakes as last year. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case wasn't the case you know like Um, the old bait and switch you talk about is that like the typical if you make these sales goals you get this amount of money and so you made your sales goals and like well actually we moved the carrot a little bit further out basically yeah um you know and i was just stuck in that moral dilemma you know it's like do you stick with a job that's slowly killing you to feed your son or do you turn your back on the teachers and students that depend on you and i chose the latter which really only accelerated my downfall Wow. So, so what ended up happening after that, after that job? Oh man. So, uh, I guess let's roll that. Let's, let's go ahead and roll into, uh, how I came up with the idea for limelight. Then <laughs> that's a story in itself. Well, sure. I mean, did you just, did you just cut the cord with that job and dive in entrepreneurship or did you just kind of start working things on the side? Uh, you know, I actually, um, just, just cause I was an independent contractor. Um, oh, okay. Yeah working from home um but basically i stopped showing up at, uh, to appointments and answering calls i basically did the bare minimum to keep ourselves afloat financially mm-hmm. concentrating on getting the foundation of limelight off the ground all right so let me take a stab at limelight uh, you know i was looking at, at the information you provided in your website so somehow limelight allows me to get access or be notified anytime there's a picture taken of me anywhere out in cyberspace is that basically how it works um kind of joe so uh what it is is it's really a discovery tool that allows users to see anywhere in the world in real time and as a byproduct of that users that are in the photo as well are sent those photos so they can have a memory of life's important moments so if i'm interested in seeing a bar down the street i'm interested in going in I'd hit a user that's currently at that bar. They'd take a picture, send it back to me. But all the people that are in that photo receive candid photos of them and their friends um, for their own personal use. So if I'm, let's say I'm the guy that's actually in the bar and I've got the app, not not that that ever happens, but let's just say I'm in a bar and uh, just kidding. But uh, <laughs> let's say I'm the guy in the bar and someone, I get, all of a sudden someone pings me and says, hey, I'm thinking about going to that bar. Would you mind taking a couple of pictures so I can see it? Even mm-hmm. though I don't know who this person is, is, is that how would that happen? Well, we're creating a connection too. There's definitely a social aspect. Okay. 
well because so it's probably guys, somebody I know or have linked up with somehow. Well, I mean, it's really based on a uh, mutual interest because okay. you're currently at the bar; they're interested in the bar, so that's how you guys build that mutual connection. And you know, you can ask other amplifying questions after that and follow up um, to create a social connection. Interesting. And if there's other people that I take a picture of, they actually get notified that there's a picture of them. So I'm thinking of the example where you're you're at some kind of event and someone takes a picture and you're in the group with someone mm-hmm. takes a picture with their cell phone and everyone has to say, Hey, would you text me that picture? Would you text me that picture so they can have exactly. access to it? This kind of helps fix that. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. All right. So you, you come up with the idea. I mean, wh- how do you get started on something like that? Are, so you're basically talking about an app? Yes. Um, but we're eventually going to go on to other platforms as well. Um, what we're going to be doing is allowing the real-time transfer of images from the DSLR camera to your smartphone, saving people mm. time and actively searching for those photos. Yeah, because, I mean, that's kind of going backwards in time when you when you take a step up from the iPhone camera and you go with the real expensive camera, and then you still got to come home and download it and do all that. Yep. Yep. And sometimes it doesn't even, sometimes it doesn't happen. The, the, <laughs> next, the next time you realize you got pictures on your expensive SLR is when the next kid event comes up and you pull the camera out. Exactly. Exactly. You know? Um, so we just wanted to make a way for people to be able to have a privately crowdsourced photo collection of themselves from this point in their life moving forward. And then where, and is the stuff stored? Are all the pictures, the data, is that all that stored inside the app? Uh, in the cloud. Okay. Yeah. And does it does it cost money? No. Uh, we're going to have it be released free. Wow. That's cool. All right. So let's back up a little bit. So you come up with this idea. It's going to be an app. H- how did you get started in that? I mean, you just didn't throw 20 grand at some app developer and say, <laughs> make it happen, right? No. So uh, let, me, let me go and backtrack uh, and tell you the story of how it really got started. So. Okay. Um, Limelight was actually conceived under unfortunate circumstances. So uh, my son was born May 8th, 2013, you know, hands down the best day of your life. And um, believe it or not, I'm actually a real private person and rarely let people into my personal life. So Mm -hmm. I texted my various friends from every phase of my life, you know, and let them know that, hey, you guys are all uncles and aunts. Congratulations, you know. (laughs) And um, one of them was my buddy, Tony. And uh, Tony was one of the best men I've ever known. Met him in my second unit, 243 ADA, proud of called this guy my brother, you know? Mm-hmm. This guy was in the car when my wife and me, or when my wife called me to say that we miscarried. Um, when my father passed in 2011, he ran the fun house while I returned stateside to say my goodbyes. Mm-hmm. So uh, when I left the army, he threw me a goodbye party. And, you know, if I was Han Solo, this guy was Chewbacca, you know? <laughs> <laughs> A uh, few people understand the bonds you form with uh, the people that you deploy with. So yeah. um, five days after my son was born, he passed, um, you know, and I was heartbroken. Uh, this guy was family to me and the guy that I really believed I'd be a great CrossFit athlete. Um, lost a brother, friend, one of my biggest supporters shortly after one of the highest moments in a man's life. So heading to his funeral, his wife asked me to contribute some photos for his wake. Uh-huh. And spent a lot of time together with this guy and it'd be great to share those memories with his family. So I searched through laptops, hard drives, and unfortunately I only had two. So, uh, we never realized the fear of missing out on the opportunity to capture those good times. So a couple of months later, you, you and him only had, you only had like two pictures of him or with him after, uh, after that friendship. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. I can Um, see that. Yeah. So, um, a couple of months later, uh, another one of my close army buddies came by to visit. Uh, so we talked about Tony's passing and how fleeting those moments are. And as we got a couple of Hennessy's deep, we thought it'd be awesome if there was a way we could crowdsource images from the people around us sent straight to our phone. And candid photos are the best ways to encapsulate the emotions associated with an event. So we thought it'd be awesome to have shots of us mid laugh after, you know, a grimy joke or mid toast, (laughs) you know, yeah, that we can look back on. So we rode the bard back that night talking about how we're going to build a tech giant. And by talking, I mean yelling because my volume knob breaks when my BAC climbs, you know, (laughs) (laughs) I love this. 
So uh, sobered up the next day, came back to reality. You know, I had a kid and I needed the income now. So uh, fast forward a couple months to, you know, I'll never forget that night, April 8th. Um, you know, my marriage was in the tanks. There wasn't any love in the house. And the only reason I stuck around is because I was a father. And, you know, I really believe the most important relationship to a boy is the one with his father. So money was running low. My son's mother would always remind me that I was dumb for leaving the stability of the army. Um, so I applied for job after job, but kept getting rejection letters. So that night we were arguing back and forth because I wanted to start driving Uber to get additional income. And she didn't like the idea, which kind of infuriated me because she didn't have any alternate solutions. So went ahead, started going through the application process at, and I had a mental breakdown, Joe. It's like uh, my huh. whole life, I worked hard to become a cab driver. You know, it's like my life lacked purpose now. I yeah. left a same career in the army, laying the smack down on terrorism to become a cab driver, you know, while other acquaintances, I mean, let's call Facebook friends what they are. You know, they were working at the big tech firms in the Valley. So I was at a real low. Um, I felt like I did all the right things in life, but I couldn't understand why I was at this point. But what hurt the most, though, was that I let my father down, you know, his son's applying to be a cab driver after he sent him off to a better future at West Point. So I cried in the fetal position for a moment, took my dad's pistol out of the closet. So I climbed into the bathtub with a 357 in hand, ready to say my last goodbyes. And the funny thing about suicide is it doesn't make sense unless you know what it's like to truly feel alone in the world. Mm hmm. Um, so my son crawled into the bathroom and held my hand, just bringing me out of my fugue. So I, I realized, Hey, I have to be successful for his sake. So I put the pistol away and I just had to leave the house to be alone. You know, found a hill, smoked in the car and made a promise to myself to make limelight happen. So next morning I went into a call at 7 AM. The teacher didn't talk to me until 845 because she was saying, Oh, we had testing and that's why the book's a month late. But I kind of just smiled at her and said, hey, this is your mess. You can drown in it, you know? So she, <laughs> kinda, she laughed nervously and I left her class, you know? <laughs> um, saw my friend Carrie on campus that day, told her about what had happened. Uh, it'd be my last visit um, because I had a promise to fulfill. And, uh, you know, she was one of my first friends after I moved back from the Army. And she kind of had an inkling that something was right, wasn't right, but she was glad I overcame it. So from that day forward, you know, hands down, one of the best decisions I've made. So after that, you know, I needed a place to start. So I got with another classmate and veteran entrepreneur in the Valley, uh, Aaron Sari, and he pointed me in the direction of some resources I could use. So I went to meetups, workshops, pitch events, you know, just testing my idea. And after four iterations, the Limelight vision was honed and refined. So Limelight's a community-driven app that allows users to see anywhere in the world in real time and have every picture they're ever in. We take proven elements from Instagram, Snapchat, and Tinder to connect users without a social connection through images of locations and events of mutual interest. So unlike other photo sharing apps, photos aren't posted online and they're only shared with the photographer, requester, and other users in the photo. We want to provide our community the ability to have a private crowdsourced photo collection of their entire life. That way, Tony's wife would have had every memory of her husband, my brother, preserved in photos. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I told you it'd be an interesting interview, Joe. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> holy cow. I mean, thanks for, thanks for sharing that story because I know that's incredibly personal and that's, that's amazingly heavy. I mean, you were, you were at the edge of the cliff and yeah. basically your son grabbed your hand and pulled you back. Yeah. You know, I'll, one day when he's old enough, I'll tell him that story and how he really uh, saved my life at a young age. Yeah, we could uh, we could have a whole another episode on 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 just that story. So, oh, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you know what's funny? Um, I was actually um talking to I uh, heard Jake Wood from Team Rubicon speak. Yeah. Uh, a couple months ago, back in November, um, kind of went through similar circumstance with a friend of his. Yeah, I saw that uh, one. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, I, I think it's a relevant issue that is really being under addressed right now. Oh yeah. I mean, it, there's veterans all across everywhere that are running across this exact scenario. And, um, you know, some of them don't get pulled back from the cliff. Yeah, um, unfortunately. I, I know of a few myself and I know of a lot of folks that, 
that had family, you know, their, their veteran family member didn't come back from the, from the edge. Sorry to hear. So are you actually involved in Rubicon with Jake Wood? I've signed up. I'm waiting for my uh, background clearance to okay. get processed, but I should be good. In Great. A few weeks. Are you? No, no, I, I, I know of him and, uh, and I saw his Ted talk about that and yep. it was very powerful and he's doing great things, uh, with that organization and a phenomenal mission, basically giving veterans a purpose again by, uh, helping out with humanitarian relief, Oh, absolutely. Getting, getting them involved in that kind of stuff. Absolutely. It's a great cause. So, so where, where's Limelight at right now in, in, you know, today? So we're actually going to be releasing, um, second week of February. Um, right now we're setting to conduct our beta test in this next week. Um, while my engineers who are doing a phenomenal job, by the way, are, uh, putting the fi- finishing touches on it. I'm out, um, I'm out with the rest of the executive team, basically making connections, getting feedback on where we are, you know, really building relationships for follow on investments down the road. Okay. Well, that's great. I'm, I'm definitely going to look it up and, uh, is it, it's not eligible to be downloaded on, as an app just yet? No, but I can invite you to the beta, Joe. Okay. Yeah, it sounds great. Now, I, I think we got wrapped up in your powerful story there a little bit. If you Go back and kind of connect the dots for us on, okay, I got a great idea for an app, and then all of a sudden, fast forward, you're about to launch. <laughs> how, how did you do that? I mean, how, how did that, did you pull some guys together and find some smart guys, or what happened with that? Yeah, so um, one of the issues um, I realized as well is that um, even though I grew up in the area, I really didn't have a professional network. And um, I was listening to this podcast series called The Full Ratchet. And um, Gil Pinchina, you know, angel investor, Uh uh, really up there in Silicon Valley, um, he was talking on his podcast how he immigrated to this country. And he went to one meetup a day for about 400 days. So I was like, man, this guy's working, you know, like I got to start doing that. That's some powerful networking. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I started looking up more meetups. Um, you know, I really didn't know, uh, what space we'd be entering at this point. So, um, just went to a bunch of meetups on big data, um, social, um, investor pitches, things like that. Um, really just trying to get out there and make myself visible. So one of my buddies, Jeff, he's actually, uh, one of my co-founders. Um, he invited me to this, uh, uh, networking event at the Jewish community center. So, um, this is about July of last year. So when I was there, um, we did a little speed networking event and, um, that's where I met John Tobin, our CTO. Um, great guy great guy, 22 years of experience. Um, and the truth is, is a lot of these engineers want to leave your big tech companies because they want to do meaningful work and have an impact, you know? Yeah. So talk to John. Um, he was currently heading eBay's mobile department and I was like, Hey, you know, let's go ahead and grab dinner, man. I want to talk to you about this idea. So, you know, wind and dined him. Um, really bought in and saw where this was going. So he's like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in. So from there, you know, we really had the, uh, officer NCO type relationship, you know, um, I would ask him so many questions, um, just because he's the technical expert on it. And I saw my main job, uh, was to resource him with, uh, the personnel he needed. So we started, um, go into more meetups with specific, um, tar- uh, with the intent to target specific people. So I would start going to design nights, um, to find a designer, um, start going to hackathons to find talented developers, you know, and really just galvanizing the team together to create the product. So eventually we, um, we, we scheduled a couple investor meetings. Um, and the big thing was that, Hey, you guys need to get your MVP out there, right? So, um, minimal vial product. Exactly, exactly. So, um, we needed a couple more engineers for that. Um, so I put out a uh, listing on AngelList, and um, we got about thirty people in the first two weeks that were interested. Now, was this costing you money with this guy you'd met up with, and and these other guys you're bringing in? 
Um, so basically, we we put them on a deferred payment for the time being. Okay, uh, and they were and good they, with that. Yeah, they they all see the bigger picture sure. of this, and um, you know, coming from our background, we uh, I was only able to raise fifteen k between friends and family, but so far we've barely started tapping into it now. So, you know, I'd say we're incredibly lean. You That's know, great. We're like three percent body fat lean. Yeah. So. Because <laughs> so, the point I wanted to emphasize is you don't necessarily have to have a bunch of money to put something together like this, as long as you find the right people. No, absolutely. So and, don't let and, money be an obstacle. Exactly, exactly. So, um, yeah, from there, um, we did a couple Skypes, a um, lot of resources out there. I mean, uh, we are barely moving into our first office next month. But uh, for the time being, what we were doing we were, is we were using the uh, conference room uh, the Palo Alto library, cause they had a whiteboard there seats, about 10 people. So that's where we'd really come together and have our planning sessions, you know? So, um, it, it goes without saying that in the military, you're always going to be undermanned, under-resourced, you know? And sure. I think, um, that experience really just taught me how to maximize the available resources we had. Man, that's so now how much of your army experience helped you through that whole process? Uh, a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you know, there's many parallels between being an army officer and being an entrepreneur. You know, I can talk about this topic all day because, uh, organizational leadership is just something that's close to my heart. So, uh, first thing I'll say is successful people build networks, you know, um, Absolutely. I realized when I first started out with limelight is that, you know, a group in the area didn't have the professional network. Um, in the army, you know, I had various contacts that I could leverage to get things done in Bahrain, for example, during the Arab spring, I led the creation of the first ever U S Bahrain security document, which outlined the duties and responsibilities for all the sec for on the Island. And a huge key to that success was building the relationships with other key decision makers and other DOD defense agencies and the Bahrain defense force. And this helped us create the document, push it through for approval over the 11th month time frame we were there. And like being an entrepreneur, you know, you have to partner with other founders that can help you out with an introduction or give you valuable insights into specific industries. And so you're a perfect example of, well, I need to find people for a specific thing or, or I just need to go expand my network. So you just started going out to networking events, not knowing what was how it was going to turn out. And that's the thing about networking that a lot of people don't get or if they've never experienced it before. <laughs> Sometimes people look at networking as, well, I'm going to go network to meet this specific guy. Well, that's not how networking operates. You go right. network, you don't understand the power of networking until some opportunity slaps you in the face or drops right in your lap because yep. you were networking. Oh, absolutely. You, you don't know where it's going to take you. So you just kind of have to have the faith and trust that networking is going to work if you go out there and do it. And once you've experienced it a couple of times, then you understand the value of networking. Oh, absolutely. I mean, my first couple of meetups I went to, you know, I was almost in a panic attack, you know, kind of... <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hey, you know, I really don't know what I'm supposed to be doing here, you know, because it all seems kind of, uh, you know, you get the follow up questions. So what do you do? And it's like, so what are you trying to do? Judge me now? You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, that that that's the business. You know, everyone's there. Everyone gets it. We're all after the same thing. So, I mean, you know, as soon as you the faster you can acknowledge that is the faster you can start building up that network. Well, Sonny, unfortunately, we're getting close to the end of our time here because I know we could go on a whole lot more about, about this, but uh, I'd like to give you a chance to put a shout out for your company. And when you're done with that, I'd like to give you the last word to speak to that, that veteran out there, whether, whether you're still in the military and looking to transition here shortly or whether you're already you know, in the process of transitioning. Speak to that veteran about who's thinking about jumping into the world of entrepreneurship. Hey, you know, I, I'll tell you what, we have the skill set to succeed. Um, and all you have to do is go out there, find an idea that you're passionate about, you know, because we've been through some of the worst times, you know, it doesn't matter where you come from, but what matters is heart. And we definitely have that after going through some of the things that we've been through. Um, go out, seek mentorship as you did in the army. You know, one of the reasons I was successful in the army is because I latched onto my NCOs. Sergeant Kent, Sergeant Noho, Sergeant Major Boone, Sergeant 
Major Torres, you know, these guys all taught me what I needed to know and go out there in the business world and do the same thing. Find that mentor that's been there, done that, you know, that way they can give you insights and help steer you along on the course. Great stuff. Great stuff. I mean, it just sage advice and, you know, age old wisdom. So uh, one last thing, just tell us uh, how we can find out more about your company and if somebody wants to reach out and make contact with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, follow us on Twitter at Get Limelight App and on Instagram at Get Limelight. Uh, sign up for our beta at Limelight Mobile Inc. Inc. dot com. Um, we'd love to hear your guys' feedback. Ten thousand service members transition every month around the globe, and using Limelight, service members can check out local events around their new duty station and connect with other service members prior to arriving to their new assignment. We're going to go live on the App Store the second week of February, so make sure to check us out. And if there's anything I, else I can do to help out, reach out to me at sunny at limelightmobileinc.com. All right, Sonny, thanks for sharing your success story and uh, reconnecting with uh, other veterans out there. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing your future success, especially with Limelight. I appreciate that, Joe. Thanks for having me and giving me the platform to spread our message. Absolutely. Hua. The Top 7 Paths to Freedom is my free gift to you for listening to the show, featuring seven great ways for a veteran to take their first step into the exciting world of entrepreneurship. To receive your free gift, go to veteranonthemove.com, or if you're listening on a mobile device, you can text the word veteran to 38470. Thank you for listening to Veteran on the Move, your pathfinder to freedom. If you like the show, leave us a review on iTunes. Reviews are always greatly appreciated. So until next time, this veteran is Oscar Mike.